So this case uh, here, we've got a shape biopsy. What do you think about this? My first chance from low power would be a DF. Uh huh. Um, but this this color red, it's not typical of a DF. Good. Yeah, that's a great example of a collar red. We can see at low power, the epidermis basically this is a lesion that is pushed up at the very top of the dermis, pushing into the the epidermis above it so much that the epidermis is reaching down around it to try to grab it. And you can actually see, depending on the angle of cut, that's what it looks like kind of at the peripheral edge, right, as we cut back into it. Those two, two arms actually connect kind of at the outer edge. So this is like kind of a, you know, an oval egg-shaped thing that's so pushed up so far that the epidermis has almost pinched it all the way off, kind of is the way I think of it. And that's a useful feature because it is a, a common thing in a handful of different entities and not something you see very often in a lot of other entities. So it can be really helpful that alone. So, like you said, you don't usually see that in uh, regular dermatofibromas, right? So what kind of thing might you see that in that you'd be thinking about here? Um, these cells are more epithelioid. They are, yep. And one of the entities where this is characteristic is an epithelioid fibrous histiocytoma. Yeah, very good. Epithelioid FH or epithelioid fibrous histiocytoma or, um, in my opinion at least, I think these are the same thing that's been described also under the name epithelioid cell histiocytoma. In the past, some people published them as that. And this is an, an interesting entity, I think, for several reasons. That I, it's a particularly interesting entity to me. Um, because these are these are kind of a benign, unusual lesion, so it's nice they're benign and, and kind of cool to look at, and they don't hurt the patient, which is great. So when you can arrive at the diagnosis of this, it's great because you're like, ah, I've got a name to put on this, and we know that these behave indolently, at least from our knowledge so far. The other reason it's interesting to me is that, you know, since the time I was in training till now, our knowledge of what these are has evolved a good bit. So in, in training, I, my concept is that these are like an epithelioid variation of dermatofibroma, which is also known as benign fibrous histiocytoma. And the name, the name fibrous histiocytoma is problematic, right? Because it's in so many different soft tissue entities, many of which are unrelated. But the thought is maybe these were weird epithelioid variants of dermatofibroma. But even from when I was a fellow, that idea didn't sit particularly well with me. Uh, just because it's so unusual, it's got, why is the collarette there? You know, epithelioid plump cells we can see in a DF, but why is there this collarette? Why is the lesion very nice and sharply circumscribed? DFs usually are not sharply circumscribed. They trickle into the dermis and wrap around collagen, but these lesions usually are very sharply circumscribed and well demarcated, you know, where you can see exactly where the lesion ends and the dermis begins. I feel like that's the majority of these that I've seen. That's very characteristic, even if they don't have a collarette. And then, um, then the cytology is different. And the other thing that's a little unusual is that these can express, I think it's almost 50% in some studies, EMA, epithelial membrane antigen. So EMA is, not, I mean, I don't know why they express that, but, but that's a weird thing because that's not something you think of as a dermatofibroma marker. So it always seemed kind of strange to me that there were several things about this that were very different from regular dermatofibroma. But I remember sending, uh, signing out a few reports early in practice, you know, saying, well, we think these are variants of of dermatofibroma. But then um, some new uh, new information came from uh, from Jason Hornig and colleagues, and they published, I think they were the first ones to publish, um, I believe it was with uh, Leona Doyle, I believe was the first author on that paper, um, and uh, they published that these are ALK positive, ALK1, uh, ALK anaplastic lymphoma kinase, ALK1 uh, positive in like 88, I think, percent. Like So, you know, the vast majority of the lesions were positive for that. And we now know that these have a variety of different ALK fusions with various different partner genes um, that are present. So it's uh, added to the growing list of different um, human neoplasia that have ALK rearrangements. And in the skin, there's not a lot of things that have ALK, right? So it's really helpful that when you see this and you think of it and then you've got ALK, well, that's pretty good. The things that rule out, the main things I can think of in the skin that have ALK, um, uh, you, uh, spitzoid lesions, right? Spitzoid neoplasms and in the range between both, both spitz nevi or atypical spitz nevi and spitz melanomas, uh, both, both the malignant benign and the kind of gray zone ones can have ALK um, positivity. So if you're having these, usually when I have one of these, I will usually do a SOX or an S100 just to make sure that I've excluded melanocytic 
because uh, it would be a totally different approach there. And then very rarely, you know, the, when we have anaplastic large cell lymphoma in the skin, the cutaneous type usually does not have ALK, uh, as opposed to the systemic nodal type, which usually is ALK. So those are uh, two things called anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which are basically unrelated. They look similar, but they're unrelated. So that's a topic for a whole different video. But it's extremely rarely the systemic ALCLs can evolve the skin. I have never seen an ALK positive systemic ALC on the skin personally, but, um, but I, I believe it has been reported to happen. So there, there are those rare exceptions. Um, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors can have, uh, oftentimes have ALK rearrangements. Um, although, um, in my experience, those are quite rare in the skin. I've seen like a couple ever, uh, much more often to be in the, inside the body. And I may be forgetting something else, but those are the top ones that kind of come to mind. So the, so it's nice to be able to find this. So in any case, what I see when I see this lesion with the collarette, then I see it's sharply circumscribed. I see that there's these big plump epithelioid cells. And th this is the reason, again, that it's good to recognize because, you know, otherwise you might start thinking all sorts of other stuff for this. You know, the uh, reticulohistiocytoma um, can have cells that are very big and epithelioid like this. And sometimes those, when they're multifocal, are associated with uh, arthritis and, and some of those neoplasia and other things like that. Um, you could start thinking of melanoma or melanocytic things. You could think a little of epithelioid sarcoma, maybe. Um, you could think of, uh, of a variety of other things, right? These big, plump, almost some of them are kind of rhabdoid looking. But so once you arrive at the diagnosis of epithelioid FH, then suddenly, oh, it's okay now. So this is like the really, to me, like a real nice classic one with a big epithelioid cells. The other things that they have oftentimes is they tend to have pretty dense collagen in the background. We can't, oh, there we can see it better. It's kind of sclerotic, hyalinized, really dense pink background in between the cells. And sometimes the cells are more uh, in kind of diffuse sheets like we saw over here. And other times they're kind of embedded in single cells within this dense collagen kind of background. And then look at the dilated vessels. The dilated vessels I find to be pretty helpful. They, I would say the majority of cases I've seen have these very big ectatic vessels with the sclerotic collagen and then with the plump epithelioid cells and then sharply circumscribed and usually with a collarette. So epithelioid fibrous histiocytoma. And usually when I diagnose these, I, I add a comment that these are benign lesions that are, that are usually associated with ALK fusion and uh, that they are unrelated to actual benign fibrous histiocytoma slash dermatofibroma. All right, let me show you a couple of the variations on this because over time, the other thing I've recognized is that I think that these, this entity has a wider range of morphologic features than we, at least than I previously appreciated. So let's look at a couple other examples to get a feel for the range here. Oh, that one's got a scratch cover slip. Let's see if I can find a better section. That'll do. The vessels are really prominent. Yeah, you're right. The vessels are very prominent in this one. And this one, even though it is pushed up, it doesn't really have the collarette, right? It's making more of a kind of a polypoid papule without, at least if there is a collarette, there could be, I guess, deeper down that we're just not seeing on this biopsy, but it doesn't stand out. But look again how sharply demarcated, like that is the edge of the lesion right there. No question about it, right? It just is completely on its own, separate from the background dermis and the dilated vessels, the dense collagen. Look at that. So once you've seen a few of them, they have a pretty distinct look. But again, there have been some that I've seen that looked a, a little funny. And it was only once I thought maybe it could be. And then I did the ALK and it was positive And I was very happy that I was able to figure out the case. Again, with the plump cells, some are kind of plasmacytoid to rhabdoid. Sometimes they're spindled. There's one, a mitosis in there. You can see some mitoses occasionally. And um, this one has a little tiny baby hair follicle over it. I think that's just a little coincidence there. Or maybe a bit of like kind of a follicular induction, which can happen over DFs, but can happen over a variety of other lesions too. So that's a good, a good, uh, another variation of it. Let's see what else. Oh yeah, this one has the collarette, but it's been ulcerated. It's been, you know, picked at. But this one also has very plump cells and the cytoplasm is kind of more eosinophilic in this particular case. But again, the dilated vessels are there, right? Mm -hmm. I guess I didn't clean that well enough. 
it's got like half a collarette on this one. This one pushes down a little bit further. And I have actually now seen several that were like formed nodules that pushed way down into the reticular dermis. So that I remember when I first saw that, that kind of surprised me because all the other ones I'd seen were up very superficial. But I've seen some that made nodules that pushed way down. And I've actually, like I saw one on like the toe once that made nodules pushing all the way down to right next to bone really surprised me and it was actually only like i remember i was on my way out of town and i thought maybe i'll do an alk just in case and uh, my colleague sent me a picture and she's like look what's positive and it was alk and i couldn't believe it so it's one of the ones that really stretched my imagination of what can happen this was a good one too because there are some epithelioid cells but there's also kind of a more spindly look in some areas right so i feel like even though the name says epithelioid i've certainly seen a handful of examples that were quite spindly and kind of story form and really didn't look very epithelioid or had just some epithelioid, but the other cells were much more spindled. I mean, for sure, this actually looks, if you gave me that picture, that would look fine for a regular dermatofibroma, right? Mm -hmm. But then this one had the ALK, so. And then what about this? This is weird. This is pushed up into the right below the epidermis. You can just barely see the collarette there. It's got the vessels. But then when you get closer, what is going on with the cells? They've got like all these vacuoles, like kind of like almost look like little tiny fat cells or something. They're very vacuolated. And where you do see intact cytoplasm, it has a frothy, foamy, or even in some areas, uh, I thought it looked even a little granular in appearance. I actually even thought about maybe a granular cell tumor in some areas. But this ended up being negative for S100, positive for ALK. Um, we may have even done a vascular marker on it just to be sure. And so I, I thought this was pretty wild that it's got these vacuoles and this foamy to granular cytoplasm. All the other stuff here was good for epithelial FH, but I had never seen, and I don't think I've seen another one quite like this since. I have seen a, another, at least another one, aside from this, that was very granular, that had areas that looked very much like granular cell tumor, but the more the architecture wasn't right, and then the ALK was uh, able to resolve that for us too. And I do imagine there will be more entities in the future that come out that we dis discover that have ALK. So, so continue to stay up with the literature if you're watching this at home, and you too, of course, Fatima and myself, to you know to keep uh, keep up with any new entities because I suspect that people will continue to find more things. But I think it's a good entity to be aware of, and uh, one that's uh, benign and interesting. And there have been some that have been reported to actually have. I don't have an ha example handy, but I'll put it back here while I'm talking so people can look at that, that some uh, have had um, uh, chondroblastoma-like areas in them. Um, and the, the group from, I think, Cleveland Clinic and Mayo and some others, I think, collaborated together to describe that a few years ago, if I recall. And uh, that's pretty cool. So they have these areas that look like kind of the, the bean-shaped cells and a little bit of a lace-like osteoid like you see, or calcification chicken wire calcification like you see in a chondroblastoma of bone. And I've now seen a one or two of those, and I've seen a couple that actually had like kind of well-formed bone and cartilage. So again, the range of features that I see in these, it continues to expand the more of them I look. So now if I even think about it, I do the ALK. 